we've seen other nations have their flag out there more than once on the sun on the bar, and this is, I believe, the first time that we've had the stars and stripes on the bar two of them together. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited to have Beth Scott. Beth Scott is a United States Paralympian. She learned how to swim at age five and in college was elected captain of her swim team at Ball State, where she set school records and won a conference title. Beth earned 17, 17 Paralympic medals, 10 gold, two silver, five bronze in the Barcelona, Atlanta, and Sydney games between 1992 and 2000. She had seven world Paralympic and American records, and in 1993 and 96, she was chosen as the USOC Blind Athlete of the Year. Beth, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's a pleasure. There was a clarification. I always like to have a fun fact, but there's a clarification that you had seven world records <laughs> and one just got broken. Yes. And how long was it in, in existence? And tell me about that. Yeah, I think it was my 400 freestyle from the 1992 Paralympic Games. Um, and it was it was a great race, actually. It was very exciting because three, uh, we swept the race. America swept that race. And... Um, it was some. It was a very prideful moment for us, but uh, a good time for me. And um, you know, for to have lasted as long as it did with mm -hmm. all the up and coming, you know, fantastic Paralympic swimmers that are moving up in, into uh, the world, um, it's kind of a compliment to me, but also a compliment to them to all the hard work they've put into the pool to actually break that record. So. Mm -hmm. And Happy to have set the bar. <laughs> I am extremely excited. This is you know the epitome of overcoming challenges. Um, so I'm really excited to dive deep into this. And for people who don't know, tell people what's the Paralympic Games and how do you qualify? Um, the Paralympics are actually the second largest sporting event in the world, uh, with only the Olympic Games um, surpassing us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they began not long uh, after World War II, uh, where a doctor, a British doctor, Sir Luca Goodman, had realized all of the patients that were in in the hospital were, that were had injuries such as spinal cord injuries or mm. amputations and, and, and various other types of, of injuries. Um, they were just lying in beds, not doing anything, not participating in life. And he saw that there was a great need to get them out in the sunshine and outdoors and doing things that would kind of get them back into life. And uh, he began the Stoke Mandeville Games, which Stoke Mandeville was the hospital he worked at. And the athletes just you know, kind of evolved out of that. And then a few years later, um, several years later, really, in ni uh, 19, it was uh, 1960, I believe, in Rome, were the first true uh, Paralympic Games. Mm. And so how do you qualify? What, what is the criteria for being able to participate? Well, the athletes have to have a physical disability, not a mental disability. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to go through a medical classification, mm -hmm. uh, and in my case, it was an eye exam where mm -hmm. they ask you to look at the eye chart, and, and it's best corrected vision, by the way. So if I had glasses, which I don't, I'd have to put those on and read the eye chart, yeah. and then they look inside your eye to make sure there is actually something wrong with it if they, in fact, can right. see it. Because um, people will look at you and be like, you look and act and feel like anyone that someone's met like what uh and obviously we'll get into you're, that you're dodging around the word normal i see <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to use the word i don't like to use the word normal for anything actually <laughs> but, i'm far from it yeah uh, it's it's just a matter of they they need to make sure that you know the people that they're they're letting to compete in the paralympic games are legitimately have their disabilities yeah. and they also do another set of tests for different specialization within the sports. Um, there are 13 different categories in swimming yeah. uh, of different classifications. Okay. Um, and I'm in the, the blind category, which is the S11s through S13s, and I'm an S13. Um, and then there's S1 through S10, which are like more the functional classes where you've got amputees, wheelchair, cerebral palsy, dwarf, um, okay. uh, a multiple of different yeah. types of disabilities, but they all kind of have to be grouped because you're yeah. not necessarily going to have everyone's not going to have double leg amputees and to be able to put them all in one race. You right. got to kind of mix and match their abilities. Yeah, I thought it was important just to mention that because some people may not know what 
what the Paralympic Games are, how you qualify, and I thought that was very interesting. And yeah. a fun fact about you, Beth, is you're a contributing author in Thyroid Cancer, A Guide for Patients, second edition, which is a resource book, which we will get into why later. Okay. We'll, we'll save that. Um, but <laughs> I want to find out from you, growing up, where are you from? What was a big, big influences for you growing up? Um, I, I, I was a military brat, so I moved around quite a bit. Um, so that's a hard answer to give you, but for the most part, I grew up in Maryland. Um, and I really was exposed to the water, even as a, a child, and I really loved it. And my parents spent most of their time dealing with the tears of getting out of the water when I was a kid, and, and I didn't want to leave the water. So I kind of took to the sport very naturally, and I just really, really loved it. And it was just seemed like a natural fit for me. So it began really early on, and at five, I was on my very first swim team, and I still remember, and quite fondly remember, uh, my first swim coach, um, who I give a lot of credit to because she did something that I don't know if a lot of coaches would ever do, and I actually think about this a lot when I'm coaching, and that is she gave me a chance, and she knew that I wasn't the strongest swimmer, and I certainly wasn't the best swimmer, and um, in fact... I was so little that we couldn't find a swimsuit to fit me at the time. So um, she asked me to swim 25 breaststroke. And I looked up at her, very excited to be able to have the opportunity to swim. And she said, and I said to her, but I don't know how to swim breaststroke. And uh, some of my coaches today might argue I still don't know how to swim breaststroke. <laughs> but I lo she looked at me and she said, well, then what do you know how to swim? And I said, doggy paddle, very proudly. And uh, she said, well, swim that. And she very easily could have swim said, oh. that. Yes. yeah, she very easily could have said, well, we won't have you in the race. You know, we'll put somebody else in. And she could have pulled me to the side and benched me, if you will. But I think she saw the excitement and knew that this is like the birth of something big for me. And, you know, I raced the fastest 25 doggy paddle on, on the face of the earth. And I had smile from ear to ear. And I still fondly remember that race. And no officials came up and disqualified me. They probably didn't have the heart to do it. But um, as you know, breaststroke is not a competitive stroke. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it all began. It was very humble. And um, I kind of reflect on that a lot and realize you, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> so when did your Olympic dream, when did you realize that you were going to have this Olympic dream? I, um, as I got older, I, I started kind of cluing into things that were happening in the sport world of swimming. And I was really fondly remember watching the Los Angeles 1984 Olympic Games and I mean I vividly remember the uh, Levi's kind of felty looking uniforms um, today they might not be so fashionable but back then that looked amazing and all the colors and the you know hoopla and the stands and the cheering and then seeing our US swimmers just destroy in the pool just blow people out of the water and you know, seeing them up on the podium and watching the tears running down their cheeks, I connected to that. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to experience that. I want to be an Olympic swimmer mm -hmm. and I want to win a gold medal. And from basically that point forward, that's what I saw in, the, in my mind. And I knew that that was something I was going to strive to achieve. Yeah. So. And you, you know, Beth, you've overcome a lot. You've had a lot of roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Tell us some of those roadblocks from early on and then, you know, that you had to overcome. Yeah, well, um, I was I was born. We probably should probably state this that I was born with a vision impairment. Um, I actually originally the doctors thought I was going to be totally blind. I have something called ocular albinism and congenital nystagmus, um, and a very rare condition that I have, and it's genetic. But surprisingly, no one on either side of my family has ever had it. Um, so when I was born, they could tell several months down the road that I wasn't focusing and tracking objects correctly and that there was something not right. And I was the first born, so my parents were obviously concerned and worried, and they both were kind of from the medical field, so they knew something wasn't right pretty early on. And uh, they took me to anyone and everyone they could to get hopefully a different answer, and it kept coming back as, oh, we're sorry, your daughter's going to be totally blind. She might have the ability to see light or have some light perception or shadows, but nothing, you know, with, with what I see the world now mm -hmm. as. Mm -hmm. That's and devastating. A, must be devastating it, for it a was, parent to hear I that. I can't even imagine. I, 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 I shudder to think what that was like for them, and, and I give them a lot of credit for being as brave as they were because 
they did take me to an expert, and I'm not going to mention the hospital because I don't really want to do that because I'm sure have made several great evaluations of patients since then. Mm-hmm. But um, the doctor told my parents that, um, this is at nine months old, mind you, um, he, he said that I would be totally blind, which is an incorrect diagnosis, as we now know, and that um, the best thing for me and the easiest thing for them as parents would to place me in an institution because mm-hmm. I wasn't going to grow and develop and thrive like other children. Um, and ironically, my mom actually wrote a letter to that doctor after I'd won my seven gold medals in Barcelona. And she wrote him and she said, you were right about one thing. She didn't grow and develop like other kids. I don't know how many mm-hmm. other of them have seven gold medals. So, um you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting. It started out so young that there was already people placing barriers up. Um, and it's scary to think, too, that was 1974. We're not talking like, I mean, I know I'm getting older, but it's not the dark <laughs> ages, you know. And how many other parents did he say that to of yeah. kids that were And they, if they listened, right. Yeah. Because your yeah. parents didn't listen. No, they didn't take heed as advice at all. And thankfully, nurtured me in an environment that was, you know, supportive and encouraging and, you know, try these try all different types of things and that's the key I think for me was that they allowed me to to explore what my limitations were I set the bar as to what my limitations were Mm -hmm. I mean I tried tennis and I realized that the object of tennis was not to chase the ball around the court because that's what I ended up doing all the time not actually striking it and getting it over the net so I knew that that wasn't my sport and that's kind of how it just was so much easier to fall into swimming yeah so you had other naysayers along your journey too I did. I mean, I I had a teacher in in elementary school. I struggled, too, with learning disabilities, which were kind of, um, you know, probably more than likely, you know, combination of my vision impairment and my learning disabilities. I had dyslexia. But, I mean, I couldn't see the chalkboard, so I was missing a lot of that information coming in from the teachers. Um, I was was completely mainstreamed in schools. I didn't have any um, support in the world of academics. Um, It was just my parents and, you know, a few tutors along the way, but no real school support. They just didn't have things at that time for people who kind of were of the middle kind of disability range. Like if you were completely blind, the school system could help you. If you were completely deaf, Mm -hmm. they could help you. But if you had some kind of middle of the road, gray area disability, um, they didn't know what to do. Which is normal. Right, um, which is good and bad because it really did affect my grades. Um, but this teacher felt that you know swimming had become too big part of my priorities in life, and that I had not, I wasn't putting enough work or effort into my my studies. And the ironic thing was is that my parents knew how much I was putting in because they were working with me like day mm-hmm. every night with me, you know, at the you know dining room table. And it was, you know, I was swimming and training a lot and I was doing really well, but it was like the only really positive thing that I felt really good about. And they knew if they took that away from me, that it would probably hurt my academics. And in fact, I think it probably would have. Yeah. So what was that teacher telling you about high school? And Well, she, she told me that, um, you know, if I didn't quit swimming, first of all, she said swimming wasn't going to get me anywhere, which we all know is wrong now. Um, she told me that I was certainly, you know, I was going to really struggle to get into high school and I certainly wasn't going to make get into college. And I always envisioned myself going to college. I never even mm-hmm. thought that, that was even a possibility that I wouldn't get in. And mm-hmm. even though my grades weren't great, I just still believed I could do that. Yeah. And um, I did all those things. I actually went to actually very challenging private high school, good counsel. Um, and then I went to um, a division one, uh, s- division one swimming program, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And I actually had the option to go to pretty much any school in the country. At the time I was ranked sixth in the nation in 200 butterfly wow. and uh, had just missed the Olympic trials by a few tenths of a second. So I was very competitive against the able-bodied swimmers and really a anything revolving disabled swimming had not entered my mind or in my competitive venue yet. I wasn't even, didn't even know it existed. So, um, how'd you handle that? Beth? Because, you know, you get, you're young, you have authorities or teachers saying you can't do something. You're not going to do something. I just had to, you know, kind of shake my head and say, you know, I don't believe what you're saying and I don't think that that's right. Just sort of what my parents did. Like, we don't Mm -hmm. think that that's the right answer to that doctor Mm -hmm. who 
who was supposedly an expert and you know they didn't listen to him and thankfully they didn't and so this this I have to actually thank these people because they were the catalyst that kind of propelled me to prove them wrong and show mm -hmm. them that you know, not only I can do these things, but other people can too who have disabilities. Yeah. And so Beth, you also had to overcome and you fight hard to get access. Yes. What, what happened with that? Well, um, this is a lot later on uh, when I would already excelled in the pool and in the Paralympics. Um, it was my last year of uh, basically my last Paralympic cycle, um, four years basically as a the, the quadrangle, and we basically had four years to try to get access to the Olympic training centers, which are there for the sole purpose of providing athletes with the resources and the ease of getting to and from practice facilities and um, you know shelter you know over their heads and food on their in their in their plates and um, good coaching and medical. And they had all these things and resources available to the Olympic athletes or the Olympic preparing athletes, but really nothing was available to us. Mm -hmm. They would allow us to come for short duration camps, like two, three days, or maybe at the most two weeks, but nothing beyond that. And I really strive to try to get support from congressmen and senators. We wrote, I wrote letters. I sent them to national governing bodies. I sent them to sponsors to try to get their attention, to try to say, hey, we want to support these athletes, you know, we'll help fund them. Um, and fortunately, we were able to get a meeting um, after several conversations with people with reasons for why we couldn't be there. I mean, the things they said were just, it was a matter of changing people's attitudes about and misconceptions of people with disabilities. One of the things they said and the reasons why we couldn't be at the training center was, if we let Paralympic swimmers come to the training center, we would have to hire more lifeguards because they would have to convert the pool into from long course, which is what we swim in when we compete 50 meters, um, to short course yards, which is not even what we compete in because they didn't think that disabled athletes would be able to make it across a 50 meter pool, which is just blows my mind, but they didn't have a clue because they'd never watched or seen or you know, really had any idea of how hard right. Paralympic athletes train and at the level which, I mean, Division One college, you know, like. Of you can swim I across can swim a pool, better. yeah. <laughs> I can swim across, I can swim better than all your lifeguards you hire, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be saving your lifeguards, mm -hmm. it's not the other way around. So, I mean, they said things too that they'd have to hire North staff for the cafeteria because, you know, they thought that blind people would go through the cafeteria line sticking their hands in the food and I'm like, where have you seen this? Like, I can do a lot of blind people, and they don't do that. We have, like, common sense, you know, and uh, an understanding of hygiene. But I, I mean, just, I laugh, but it's really not that. It's not yeah, funny. Yeah, you laugh at it, but it, It's not funny, no actually, sense. that He's they would crazy. think that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just insane to me. So we had to turn these very just grossly inaccurate mindsets yeah. to – allow us to get access but mm. this is the stuff we were fighting so how'd you do how'd you turn around their mind because that's a hard thing to do it is a very hard thing to do well we had to make sure we put our best foot forward and we we made sure that we trained hard when we finally got access it was it was a great story because we went in and met with this woman who basically you know permits and schedules all the athletes into the training center in colorado springs and uh our executive director went in and spoke to her initially without me in the meeting and she turned it down. You know, we would put forth a, a years long training uh, with, you know, basically three athletes. And she said, no, I'm sorry, there's no room at the end kind of thing. And it's, it was an Olympic year, it was 99 when we, when we proposed this. And she said, no. And he came out and told me. And I was like, well, that's unacceptable. I, I, I don't accept that. And so I'm going to go talk to her. So I went in there and I said, look, you know, I just went and watched the Olympic. Um, visitor centers um, promotional video that helps to kind of encourage people to open up their wallets and their hearts to support the USOC and the athletes training and and it was a video that showed like little little kids like dreaming of being an Olympian and then you kind of watch them go through the process of ele elevating themselves to the ranks and then finally they're there on the you know getting the medal put around their neck mm -hmm. and um, they say like the USOC and these Olympic training centers are there to help fulfill the dreams of all Olympic athletes. 
And I said to her, I said, look, I just watched this video and I want you to tell me how my dream is any different than an Olympian's dream. You know, I dream the same thing they dream and I want the same things and I proudly have represented our country and you at two separate Paralympic Games. I've won gold for this country, you know, I'm... I've done a good job being, you know, an ambassador to the U.S. Olympic Committee and to the United States. And, you know, I think that it's really something you should consider allowing us to do. It's going to be a huge impact, not just for the three of us, but for the future. And you have the power to give us this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And she started crying and she said, can you be here in January? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's what started yeah. our opportunity, and, and we went out there, and we trained, and we trained right alongside BJ. I know you had BJ on your um, your show, and uh, BJ Bedford, mm-hmm. and you know it was good for the athletes too because they were actually the first people that really got behind us and were endorsing us to the U.S. Olympic Committee, saying support these guys. I mean, this right. is not cool. You're not giving them opportunities like yeah. you're giving to us. Yeah. So. That's where it all kind of yeah. turned around for us was then. Yeah. And, and now training centers have Paralympic athletes of all different types of disabilities. They're trained there year round for sometimes four, even longer years at a time. It's fantastic. And I'm just really, really proud to have been a part of that yeah. and helping that pave that road, make it a little smoother for our athletes. Yeah. And Beth, I love that story, you know, on so many different levels because we're all trying to get access to someone yeah. and all people were trying to get access to have preconceived notions, you know, like the, as ridiculous as it sounds, I think you're going to stick your hands in the cafeteria food. But I mean, those are whatever profession, whatever industry, people have those type of preconceived notions for that. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that, just kind of pushing through and overcoming. Yeah, and, it's mostly focusing on the ability, not the yeah. disability, that people right. really need to start to, to see more of that than... You know, don't see the person in a chair, see them, you know, swimming and see them as an athlete. So it's, it's, it's more about the ability, not the disability. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So tell me about some of the biggest turning points in your career and personally. Um, I mean, I really would say uh, for me, um, in terms of swimming, a big, big moment was... Uh, going to the Paralympics in 1992, I, I, I told you I'd never been around other people with disabilities, and I went to school as basically the only kid in the school with a disability. Um, I'd never been around other people that had the similar vision impairment that I do. I'd never seen people with nystagmus, which I don't know if your viewers will be able to see, but my eyes kind of move back and forth. That's the nystagmus. And I, I never understood why people made fun of it or thought it was weird or awkward, but then I saw someone with nystagmus and I actually saw the eye movement because I can't see it. But right. when I saw someone else with it, I'm like, oh, that is really weird. <laughs> I can understand why people get a little like, ooh, what, what's going on over there? Um, but when I went to the games, I just had an amazing like aha moment. And throughout my life, um, I'd always known I was visually impaired. Um, I can't even remember a time where I didn't know I wasn't visually impaired or legally blind. And so when I was a child, like really young, three, four, five, I was praying to God. I'm a pretty religious person. And I was praying and I would I'd just pray that God would take it away, take away my vision impairment, take away this, this thing that made my life hard and challenging and yeah. different. And it just, I could not, I was living in a world where things got fixed, everything. You know, everyone else could put glasses on and could see. And, you know, you, you break your arm, you go to the doctor, you put a cast on it, a couple weeks it's fixed. You take your car to the mechanic if it's broken, you know, like, and so when you're little, you don't really understand, like, not everything can be fixed. Not everything can be fixed. So the only place I could go was to the heavens, if you will, and I kept praying and praying and praying, and over time, I realized I was waking up every morning seeing the world exactly the way I left it, and I'm like, this isn't working. Like, what, like, I didn't really give up on God. I gave up on praying about it. Like, some, I guess... I just said, I guess my miracle wasn't meant to happen for me. And so I just continued to live my life and swim and train and do all the things that, you know, the great gifts that God had given me and used them to the best of my ability. And it wasn't until I was flying back from Barcelona um, when I had won, you know, seven gold medals, which was fantastic. I was Amazing. top yeah. of the world and, you know, got to swim in the Olympic pool, just were like 
my Olympic heroes were swimming just days earlier and, you know, experienced my, my life dream of watching that fly be raised and to hear my mm. national anthem be played in honor of something I had done. And, you know, those are wonderful things, but it wasn't until I was sitting on the plane flying back to the States and I had a, a fanny pack because, you know, I wanted to set a fashion forward statement <laughs> <laughs> full of my medals because I didn't think it was a good idea to put them under the plane and get them lost in my luggage. So yeah, probably a good idea. I kept them you with just wear me. all of them. Yeah, no, this is a fat. That's a fashion faux pas right there. Too. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I took one of them out and I was just looking at it and kind of gazing at it. And, the, and it was early morning. So like the sun was like a pretty orangey, the sky and everything was orangey pink. And it was just really very pleasant. And the rays of sun were shooting through the clouds and we're already up in, up in the sky. And the sun rays are like hitting this gold metal. And it's kind of dancing across the gold and it's like hitting me in the face and all around the plane. And for no reason at all, I just started thinking about this prayer that I had as a kid and that I wanted him to take this away from me and make my life easier. Mm -hmm. And it just hit me. You know, my vision impairment and my vision problem throughout my life had actually given me more than it had ever taken away. Mm -hmm. um, two things led me to this place and this time that I was in at this moment. And it was, number one, I was a great swimmer and I deserve to be at the Paralympics for that purpose. And number two was that I was visually impaired. And, you know, these experiences that I had there, the gold medals and making the friendships that are lifelong friendships now and all those things just really... Um, toppled with the fact that I kind of realized that my vision was a gift. Um, the, my vision problem was actually a gift. And um, I just started looking at it from a completely different perspective. Um, you know, the glass was half full now. You know, the, the rose-colored glasses were rose-colored glasses. The, you know, I found the window when the door was closed. You know, it was all those metaphors that people use. And I, I just really understood it. I just got it. It just hit me. You know, I was 17 and I had 17 years to be thinking about this and, and it took me that long to really get it. Um, and I'm just really grateful for that experience because it changed how I led the rest of my life, what I majored in. Um, I was thinking I wanted to go into interior design and architecture. That's not at all what I went into. I went into sports administration and adapted physical education. Completely opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to, uh, you know, majors. But um, I'm very, very grateful for having that, that moment and really yeah. glad it happened to me. I hope it happens for other people that struggle with things. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. That is a powerful... I could just visualize that. So <laughs> thanks for painting that picture. Good. Good. Um, and, and but since it's Inspired Insider... Um, I always ask the question of the most painful moment that you had to overcome and walk us through what happened and what you were thinking along the way. Um, as far as painful, um, it was more just a shock. Uh, right after Sydney in 2000, um, I just decided I was retiring after 21 years of competitive swimming the very last race I swam was a gold medal race. The very last thing I did in swimming was to step up onto the podium and the top highest podium and have that wonderful medal hung around my neck. And the last thing I saw was our stars and stripes being raised. And the last thing I heard was our national anthem. And I thought, what a way to go out. You know, this is the way to retire from a sport. And um, less than a month after the games, I was diagnosed with cancer. Wow. And I was not expecting that at all to kind of go from cloud nine to the basement that rapidly. Um, it was quite the descent, um, free fall more like. Um, I had no symptoms. I had no warning signs other than I felt a sharp pain in my neck. I had thyroid cancer. And I, I don't know whether that was, you know, my, my great keen sense of my body and kind of knowing my body and knowing that this pain wasn't a normal pain, it wasn't like a muscle pain or an indigestion or something like I had a crick in my neck or whatever, speaking to the chiropractor right. here. Um, but I knew it wasn't right. And so I, I listened to my body and I went to the doctor and they did a bunch of tests and the blood work came back completely normal, which is not surprising with a lot of thyroid cancer patients. 
Um, but what they did was they did a biopsy, and the biopsy showed that it was 100% positive for papillary carcinoma, um, which is actually a very treatable form of thyroid cancer. There's several forms that are not treatable and that um, people actually die within one to three months of diagnosis. Whoa. Holy cow. So it's a very, um, it can be a very deadly and scary thing to be diagnosed with. So fortunately, the type I had was was treatable, and it was at the earlier stages of it. Um, and uh, I, I had a complete thyroidectomy and underwent radiation treatments. And um, about a year and a half later, I, you know, had my medications all established. And thankfully, to do do in part to the support of my loving family and friends and teammates from all over the world, country. Um, I got through that and it's, it was, it was definitely one of the toughest competitors I had to battle, but, um, different than mm. any other. What was the toughest part about it? Um, and actually part of the, the book, the, the book that I, you mentioned earlier, um, mm. the chapter that I got to write was kind of about the psychological component of, uh, my healing process. And during the radiation treatment phase, um, your thyroid uses uh, iodine, uh, like, a, like a fuel, it's, it's gas, if you will. Hmm. And when you have a thyroidectomy, you, they can never get all of the thyroid tissue completely. Sometimes they have to leave some or they have to leave some around your laryngeal nerve, right, which controls want... your ability to speak. Right. And if they mess with that or take too much tissue from it, you could lose your ability to speak. So there's still tissue, there's still thyroid tissue there, which means there still could be, at the cellular level, still cancer present. Mm -hmm. So in order to get rid of that, you have to use a radioactive isotope. And uh, in order to prepare for that, you have to withdraw from all of the things you're eating, iodine, which ironically we consume probably 300 times the amount that we really need to have yeah. um, because it's found in pretty much everything we consume. It's found in tap water. It's found in meats, vegetables, canned goods, prepackaged um, pre food. It's all over the place. Um, so I actually had to go to a kosher market to get beef because they use kosher salt rather than just regular salt to deblood the meat and I could eat that. But um, there was other things. I had, to, I had to have matzah instead of uh, regular breads because they have various iodines in it. They converted um, you. Uh, yeah, no, just... right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but uh, it was quite the learning experience. But anyway, the point is, is that when I went through all that, when you reduced your level of iodine, you're actually starving that remaining tissue of what it wants to fuel on, right? right. So when they give you the radiation dose, which you're in a hospital in a lead-lined room, it's very pleasant. It's like being the girl in the bubble kind of thing. And uh, they give you this pill, and it comes out of a little lead tube, and they are staying there in full lead aprons, handing it to you and with a Geiger counter to make sure you've actually ingested it. Um, what that does is that's radiation attached to iodine molecules. And so if you've starved adequately your thyroid tissue, the remaining mm -hmm. tissue, of iodine, it senses iodine in the body and then sucks it up like it's just craving it. So it just sucks it right up and in doing so, it's actually burning itself out because the radiation then attaches to it mm -hmm. by neutralizing that tissue. It's the only form of cancer treatments that are done that way. So it's kind of a unique and um, very efficient way of, of killing off the yeah. cancer. So when you but go you're in, in yeah. you're in isolation. You're basically considered radioactive. Like living in the D.C. area, I couldn't go on the metro. I couldn't go really? to the Pentagon, and my job involved me going to those places. So, um, because how long are you radioactive for? Well, I, I'd like to say that I'm still hot. Is but... that good in the dating world to say you're radioactive? <laughs> well, I, apparently, scientifically, I'm hot. Yes. But uh, the half life, I, I think, is basically uh, expired. Uh, as far as safety reasons, um, within six to eight days okay. of getting the dose. But for the for, for those six to eight days, you have to remain in isolation. And for the first 27 hours, I was in a lead line hospital room yeah. with no contact with me outside, the plastic all over the place, uh, very unpleasant. And then when I came home, I had to like be in a room away from my family. Um, and I talked about that in the book, which was, it was really hard because touch is such a unique and humanistic component to just thriving, you know, yeah. and I, I'm a really touchy feely person anyway. So at, I was, you know, recovering in my childhood home, but you know, my family was all around me, but I, they couldn't touch me. They couldn't, you know, hold yeah. my hand or, you know, 
I couldn't cry on their shoulder and I couldn't hug them. I couldn't be with them. And that was hard on them too, but it was, it was difficult for me because yeah. I was still dealing with, you know, being diagnosed and going through all this. But in the end, that was, ended up being the part that I wasn't prepared for. I didn't know. I thought like the surgery was going to be the hardest or this low and diet was going to be hard, but that was actually emotionally the hardest struggle to come through. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I decided that, you know, I took a negative, you know, and I turned into a positive and I put it in this book and hopefully it will help other people that mm -hmm. they will take that into consideration and um, prepare themselves emotionally for that moment when they're going through that. And their families and friends can understand it better too. Yeah, especially when they, you don't even know that to expect that. So what did you do to stay positive during those tough times? Well, I, I, took, a, um, I took a lot of my past life experiences. I think that, you know, being someone with a disability and kind of learning how to adapt and and you know I, I I strongly believe that people need to understand people with disabilities also need to understand is that and most of them do already that you know the world doesn't adapt to me I have to adapt to it I mean there isn't going to be large print you know newspapers for me to read <laughs> all the time there isn't going to be um, menus that are handheld all the time for me which would make my life easier but um you know so I just kind of learned to kind of adapt to what what's dealt you you know you just have to deal with what you're given and make the best of it um, something that a sports psychologist that I really love Kirsten Peterson was my sports psychologist in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center she's no longer working with the USOC she's now part of the Australian Olympic team hmm. um, but I still love her anyway um, <laughs> she told me to remain uh, even throughout my cancer uh, treatment she was supportive with me even then she said you know keep keep focus on staying positive and using your positive self-talk and that's something that anybody can use not just a well-trained athlete or you know um, you know a weekend warrior this can be someone in, in business if you if you say something like, for example a, a swimmer let's say or a track and field athlete like I don't want to false start I just don't want to false start if you say that it's kind of a negative and you're almost implying that you are gonna false start you right. know you are gonna jump the gun and so your mind is already thinking jump the gun jump the gun jump and that's usually what ends up happening it's like right. you're almost creating your own future um, so if you were to change that and say I'm gonna get a good clean start just saying that alone mm -hmm. does the trick and then your mind is switched over to positive thoughts mm -hmm. um, I kind of fell on that a lot when I was going mm -hmm. through my cancer which mm -hmm. was you know I'm gonna stay positive I'm gonna get through this and I learned everything I possibly could learn about thyroid cancer mm -hmm. trying to become as I don't wanna say an expert but I wanted to become as a completely well educated in it as sure. I could so I knew what was happening to me so I could understand what was going on internally so I could kind of take care of my body and take care of my mind and you know take care of my emotional part too um, all those things kind of I think helped me and I think my swimming and I think that you know my disability and just kind of nothing is gonna nothing's gonna prevent me from pursuing what I want to do yeah. uh, I just needed to keep that in the forefront of my mind the whole time yeah so Kirsten Peterson basically had <laughs> you saying the positive things yeah. and, positive. and yeah. just constantly those positive mantras right. that were going on in your head Right, yeah, and athletes use that all the time. I mean, you, you, you do visualization. What were, yeah, what were some of the positive mantras you had while you were swimming in training? Well, well you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's important, too, that people realize to, to make a, I think what really does constitute a great, strong athlete and where, what, what separates the strongest and the, you know, the gold medalist, if you will, in the world, what, what, how do they get created and why isn't there more of us, you know? And I think that what sets those people apart um, is their ability to just kind of fight through the pain. Um, I had shoulder problems uh, all throughout my career and you know rotator cuff tendonitis, bicep tendonitis, things that would normally sideline and you know basically end someone's career. I had a doctor tell me about six years before I retired that I probably should stop and I'm like they were mm. probably right though. Yeah, they probably were. <laughs> but um, you know I, I don't swim anymore but yeah. uh, mostly because of the injuries but um, I didn't have surgery and I just wanted to kind of just get through it, just got to get through it. So mm -hmm. I would say in like a three hour workout, 
the first two hours and like 15 minutes were just gut wrenching, make you kind of sick feeling shoulder pain. Um, and then around the two hour and 15 mark, they just went numb and I just finished the Even practice. Better. <laughs> and if they're numb, then I, you know, I can't feel the pain. I'll just keep going through it. I don't recommend that for everybody because I knew what pain it was. It wasn't like a new pain. It wasn't like, right. oh my God, that's stabbing horrible pain and it's, you know, I, I need to not, I need to definitely get something on that. I knew, like I said, about my, my thyroid stuff, right. I knew was the, what constituted, this is a really serious thing. Yeah. I, I know, I knew my body well enough to know what I could push through and what I couldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think a lot of really well-trained athletes have to kind of be able to balance that, like knowing what's a good pain, what's an acceptable pain, and what's the pain you yeah. can push through. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is just having you know, dreaming big and then also not just dreaming about, but believing it, like truly, truly believing it. Like I always saw myself up on that podium winning that gold medal. I could clearly see it in my mind's eye, you know, like visually out in the real world, doctors and everybody's like, oh, you can't see, you can't see, you know, you're blind. But in my mind's eye, my vision was 2020. It was perfect. I didn't need glasses or contacts to see the the dream was crystal clear to me what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pay no attention to all the other people and the naysayers. And, you know, it doesn't matter what part of the city you come from. It doesn't matter, you know, your home life. It doesn't matter your financial, you know, difficulties. You can still achieve these things. If you see it in your mind happening, it can, I really do believe it can happen. And I think I kind of proved that. Yeah. So that's another thing. And, and the other thing is just, you know, um, being your own assessor of of things in life like I had to determine okay so I'm not the best tennis player but I gave it a shot you know um, I kind of had to discover what my limitations were you know I'm probably not a good driver Um, so I'm not going to do that. So there are people with 2020 though too. You know, it's questionable. I do think there's a lot of people that don't belong on the road that I think I'd do better. But, um, the point is, is that I I think that we have to establish the, the ability to truly understand that when you set a limitation for yourself, that you really have to like kind of think about it because you don't have too many limitations, you know, like you have to be realistic. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you know how to fly? I mean, it's okay. You don't have a pilot's license. You're not less of a person because you don't fly. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't have a pilot's license, but I don't have a driver's license. But that doesn't mean I can't get around. It doesn't mean I can't right. go throughout the world and doing things. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, but I have driven illegally in Indiana, but no cows were injured. I promise. <laughs> Good. Promise. <laughs> Beth, going from that low point, what's been the proudest moment? Oh, gosh. Well... We touched on this earlier, um, which was getting access uh, to uh, the U.S. Olympic Training Centers for uh, disabled and Paralympic athletes. Um, it's just been a really long journey to have that occur and happen. Um, I just think people need to appreciate kind of the history that we've kind of, we've really made a lot of progress in a very short period of time, but it's been a long time coming from the from the infancy of the Paralympics in, in 1960 to to today, um, when I went to Barcelona, I actually had to have a bake sale and some like music folk music concerts at my school to raise money so that I could buy the Olympic you know uniform that I wore up on the medal podium. Wow. So I you know whereas at the Olympic level, America sends its athletes to the games. But in the Paralympics, you know, it was, you know, my bake sale funds. You have to, <laughs> you have to, to scrap the together, yeah. Um, so we didn't have a lot, and we didn't have all the sponsors. We didn't have any kind of marketing really going forward uh, mm. back in 92. Um, our uniforms uh, could probably double as, like, Domino Pizza delivery people. I mean, it was like this. we had the, we had the offset of, of what the Olympic athletes got, and we got nothing in comparison to the amount of goodies that they got. Um, and that continued actually all the way through to Sydney. And Sydney was the first time we actually got uniforms that were almost identical to the Olympic uniforms. Um, the Olympic uniforms in Sydney were white uh, Adidas uniforms. And Adidas is a, a European co- company. And they have, for many, many years, always sponsored uh, countries of, in the European countries. They've sponsored both Olympic and Paralympic athletes. And so whenever they've done the teams, 
the uniforms are exactly the same. There's no difference. They don't, they don't separate their uniforms. They're made and manufactured and designed exactly the same for both teams. Mm -hmm. And when they won the bid to do the uniforms in, nine, in 2000, and the USOC said, okay, you know, which uniform are you doing for the Olympics and which one are you doing for the Paralympics? And like, no, 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 we're doing the same uniform. We don't do different uniforms. That's not the way it works. And um, the USOC said, oh, well, usually we don't do it that way. And he's like, well, we're going to get out of this contract if you don't let us do it that really? way. Really? Wow. So they stood Good up for them. us, which was yeah. awesome. Um, what ended up happening was the Olympic athletes got white uniforms and the Paralympic athletes got red. And although they're different, the exact design was present. I mean, it was right. very, very identical. But the Olympic athletes ended up liking the Paralympics uniforms better because the white showed so much dirt and they got messed up and... Um, so it was kind of funny how ironic that it turned out that they actually liked ours better. <laughs> so so what, like, what was the most memorable gold for you? I, you know, getting that Paralympic, you know, the train, getting in the training center was huge. What was the most memorable gold? Oh, memorable gold. Mm. <laughs> um, they all, I mean, they all really do mean a lot to me. Ironically, one of the more valuable ones to me wasn't even a gold. It was a it was a bronze. It was one in um, Atlanta, and um, we were up against quite a tough slate of competition. And we didn't have the strong a relay team that year. We kind of struggled um, with some of our our teammates were not having as good a, a games as they would have liked. But one of my teammates had been to several of the Paralympics that had never won a, a good medal. And this is her first opportunity to actually maybe get one. And I really wanted her to be able to go home with some hardware. So I was the anchor on the relay, which puts a lot of pressure on me. Um, because when I jumped in, we were last by over half a pool length. And that's more than 25 meters because it's a 50-meter pool, which is, in most cases, you're out of the race. I mean, you just can't make that up. And it was only two laps, so it was only 100 that I was doing. Um, so I only had 75 meters to make up that distance. And uh, that's not a very long period of time in less than, than about, like, it took me about a minute just from the race. So that's not a lot of time to catch up that much. And I went in about 20 seconds behind the person. Wow. And ended up touching them out by about three tenths of a second getting the bronze. And I've never been so excited for someone else to win a medal. Um, and that was really kind of a cool thing. But... I think, too, is that winning gold medals is a lot less about winning them and more about what you do with them. Um, when I was a kid, I had an Olympic, I met an, my first time ever meeting an Olympian. She was a swimmer, um, and she came to talk to our swim team about her experience. She was in the Los Angeles Olympics and won gold, and she told us all about it and her experience and how exciting it was to win. and. At the end of her little presentation, we all got in line and waited for an autograph and, you know, hopefully to get a chance to touch this medal. And when I approached her, sitting right next to her in a black leather pretty box was this medal just staring right at me. And I, and I was mesmerized. I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm in the same room with a gold medal. And, you know, I got her autograph and I was just still just staring at this medal, not even looking at her. And I'm just like, can I touch it? And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't let anyone touch it. And I, uh, I looked at her kind of just like, what? What do you mean you don't let anyone touch it? I'm, I'm 10. I want to touch your gold medal. Like, are you crazy? Just let me touch it. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. I, I don't let anyone touch it because the oil from your hands can, like, cause the gold to tarnish. And I just thought that was a bunch of baloney. I'll, I'll use that word rather than another one. Um, and I went out. I was very disappointed. I don't have a clue where this girl's autograph is or where the picture is that was taken with me with her because it didn't matter anymore because she obviously was not someone I wanted to emulate. Um, but I went out to my parents' station wagon. My parents came pick me up. And I got in the car and I crossed my arms and I said, Mom, Dad, if I ever win a gold medal, I'm going to let anyone and everyone touch it. And who knew, but like 10 years later, or actually less than that, seven years later, I was actually winning my own. And I kind of make that a part of my message to people is that, yeah, a lot of my medals are tarnished and they've got chips in them and they got scratches. Um, I'll always know what color they are. So if the gold actually eventually does kind of start to fade, I'm always going to know what color they are. 
Um, but to me, it's more important that the gold gets rubbed off on someone else yeah. and that they actually experience that moment. There's so few gold medals in this world, and there's even fewer Olympians and Paralympians that just happen to have them out and available for people to touch them. So it does no good for an Olympic or a Paralympic gold medal to be in some safe to deposit box. It does a lot more when it gets hung around the neck of a little six-year-old who will never probably ever have another opportunity to experience yeah. that. And adults too, they kind of get all, <laughs> I don't know who looks more excited, the kids or the parents or, or the adults who get to actually experience it. I actually have my medal here. Would you like to see yeah, it? Yeah, of course. I don't know how this is going to come out. And when I see you, I want to touch it. This one it. from, uh, yeah, you want to reach out and touch it When now. I meet you in person someday, I'm going <laughs> to touch it. That's right. That's right. You come out to DC. This is actually the medal from Barcelona. I mean, from, I'm sorry, from Sydney. Yeah. And it's a gorgeous wow, medal. Wow, it is gorgeous. a lot of detail in it. Yeah. And the gold was actually mined in Australia. And it's got all the different um, wow. venues that were used in, in Sydney. That's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's cool. I could see how looking at that on the plane ride, it would just reflect everywhere. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you write your biography, your autobiography, or your book eventually, if you You're come out with it. one, you'll, be, you'll I'll be the buy one it. Buys it. Yeah, but <laughs> the title should be something like Gold Rub Off on, Gold That Rubs Off on Someone Else. And that should be like yeah, the opening along story. Those lines. Yeah, yes. we'll work on that. We'll yeah. have another like, brainstorm. I like, I like that one. Um, so, yeah. And, and Beth, thank you for telling that. I love that. Um, <laughs> what about some of the influential coaches and mentors that you had? Because we, we all get to that place and it's hard work, but we have a lot of people helping us too and pushing oh, us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who are some um, of the most influential in that I'm regard? I'm not going to call it each and every one of them. There's yeah. been so, so many. Um, and that's something, too, that when you know people often ask me, when you were up there on the, on the podium getting that medal hung around your neck and as the national anthem is playing, what's going through your mind? And, mm. you know, it's really an easy answer, and that is faces, just images of all the people throughout my entire career flash in front of my eyes. And that's what I'm seeing when I'm experiencing that so that first coach who said go ahead and some doggy paddle that right. person's face flashed in that moment flashed in my mind um, you know my teammates from like when I was a little little kid all the way up through college um, you know my Paralympic teammates I mean my competitor even some of my competitors I mean you don't get to the level of swimming that I was at without having people push you and make you better and your competitors do that for you too. Officials, like swimming officials. I love swimming officials. I was on the official swimming committee uh, for many, many years as an athlete rep. I mean, we wouldn't be the dominating swimming power that we are in the world without amazing officials. Um, you know, though it's better to be disqualified at some rinky dink, you know, local meet than to get disqualified at the Olympics. And because of our high level of you know, officials, they put us to uh, the highest Olympic standards. standards, yeah. Right, the whole and way make through. sure from the very beginning, from the earliest stages that you know, you know, you can't do that and you got to fix this and let, let's let's work with your coaches to get that done. And yeah. so like even the, even, the, even the people that are literally walking the silence of the pool help make not only myself but other Olympians and, mm -hmm. and you know, high level athletes get to where they're at. Um, obviously I had Im immense support and help from my family. My, my God, my parents, um, <laughs> unfairly probably they felt at times, um, when I was like 17, 18, 19 years old, I still needed a ride because I wasn't driving and I don't drive. So they always had to drive me to practice at four o'clock in the morning. Wow. So I don't even know how they did that. Would, that'd be tough. <laughs> I'd but, be like, uh, uh, walk. <laughs> yeah. Except it was a good 40 minute drive. <laughs> um, so, you know, in the winter, uh, so I just, I really think that there's so many people and I don't want to call them out. I had so many incredible coaches. I had some of the top coaches in the world work with me. And, um, you know, I, I, if I start calling them out now, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to forget some Any Anyone that gave you an especially um, influential or key piece of advice at a key moment for you? Well, there, there was a, a coach that um, there was a time where I would say – there's very few moments throughout my career that I felt like I was really in the zone. You know, when I talk about the zone, yeah. um, which might seem surprising to you, but it doesn't happen all that often. It's kind of like a little magic moment. And uh, you really have to just be in the right state of mind for that to happen. And it was my junior, I think it was my junior year in college. And we had a coach, and I will mention his name, Brian Varab. He was amazing. 
Um, he, throughout that entire season, I had an amazing season that year. I was just doing best times all throughout the year and um, ended up going and finally making it to conference championships. And I'd basically just done really, really well. And I'd, I'd swum prelims and done my fastest time yet that year. And I was ranked going into that finals that evening in third position, which is actually a really good position to be in. You're not really, you're not first, so you're not the rabbit, you know, but you're chasing, which is almost better, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and I got out of the pool thinking he'd have all these compliments and positive things to tell me about my race. And he goes, that was good, but now we're going to change your turns and your breathing pattern, which is basically 75% of a race. <laughs> so I was like, what? Like, now you're going to tell me to change these things? Like, wouldn't this have been good to tell me about six months ago? <laughs> like, why were we working on that then? I'm like, I've got three hours. Like, are you crazy? And he's like, no, no, no. We'll work on it at warm-ups tonight. You'll be fine. You can do it. And I'm like, I, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, I can either do what coach says and it all go wrong and I blame him <laughs> or do what I want to do. And then I only have myself to blame. So I figured I kind of share the load a little bit. And, uh, I took his, I took his advice and I, I was telling everyone around me, I was they're kind of like, Oh, are you going to beat, you know, so-and-so are you going to, you're going to win the race. I'm like, look, I'm just going to do the best I can. And you know, however I am, whenever, whatever my time is, that's the best I could do on that day at that moment. Mm -hmm. And something else a sports psychologist told me, which was you can only control what's between the two lane ropes you're swimming in. So there's no, I mean, if someone in lane one wants to have an extraordinarily amazing swim, I have no control over that, you know? And, and so I just jumped in and I had this reoccurring thing in my head that I was going to, had a breathing pattern that he told me about. And I kept saying that over and over and it was like almost a little, little bit of rain man going on. Then <laughs> I was just like, breathe every other, breathe every other. And then he taught me how to do something with a turn was where you just kind of sink down. It's kind of a lot involved, but I kept saying to myself, breathe every other, breathe every other, sink into your turns. And that was like just something I just kept saying over and over and over again. And so much so that I was not paying attention to the other athletes being announced, which was a very distracting thing when you start hearing like the accomplishments of yeah, the people around I, you. Yeah, for sure. And you're like, you have to block that out. I mean, and, and you just don't really want to listen to it. You just want to like have your thoughts be on what's at stake, you know? And so I just kept mm. saying it and saying it and saying it. And all I was waiting for was to hear the command of the official as they step up onto the blocks and take your mark and then waiting for that sound to go. And I saw none of the race except what was in front of me. And I didn't see anyone else. I didn't really notice anything else. And to the very last length of the tuner fly, so there's eight lengths of that. And I pushed off the wall and I looked in front of me thinking that my greatest competitor was going to be way out in front and dried off on the pool deck, basically, because that's where she'd been the last two years prior. And so psychologically, that probably wasn't a good thing, but it was just, you know, I wasn't thinking I was far ahead because I wasn't watching the race. And I looked far ahead and there was nobody there. I'm like, wow, okay. And so I looked right next to me and there she was, right neck and neck with me. And because my coach had given me this new breathing pattern, I had a lot of oxygen left and I had, I had a lot of kick in my legs. And one of my um, nicknames growing up was Thumper because I had a really powerful kick and it was almost a little too powerful and you could hear it in an indoor pool. It was a thump, thump, thump and it was very, very loud. So I just put that into you know high gear and it propelled me to the wall and I and I I touched her by just like maybe five tenths of a second I think it was, wow. but enough. And I it's the ironic thing is I had no idea at one. I had no idea because I couldn't see that the clock was way far away from me, and the only way I knew was that she was throwing her goggles and kind of having a little bit of a fit that she'd lost, and that was my cue to know that I think I might have just won that. So. <laughs> Um, that was a pretty big uh, victory and one that I'm really proud of. Um, not because I beat somebody else, just because I kind of overcame this kind of, you know, understanding of like you have to be in yourself. You can't be worrying about anybody else around you. Mm -hmm. And it was a good lesson to learn. And my coach kind of helped me do that with having the repetitive words and thoughts. But then also mm -hmm. just from my own experience as an athlete, you just really can't look at anybody else a lot of people th remember michael phelps's 100 fly swim where he almost got he almost that other guy almost won remember that race mm -hmm, yeah and you could see the underwater touch yes was the like underwater insane. touch insane like how did this guy lose and every swimmer knows how that guy lost 
And it was because if you look at the picture, he's actually looking at Michael Phelps in the next lane. He looked at him. And because he looked at him at that moment, his, his body energy wasn't going forward. It was kind of going sideways because of his, just this. That's all he had to do is change his positioning just enough. And that's what did it. Wow. And so you can't pay attention to anyone else. You've got to swim your own race or you've got to live your own life and not, you know, try to compare yourself to other people or, you know, it's just got to be what you set out to do. Yeah. You can only control what's between those two lane ropes. Right. I like that. <laughs> yep. So, Beth, what does it take? We were talking tenths of a second, hundredth of a second. What does it take to be best in the world? Uh, just pushing through the pain, um, believing that you can achieve these goals you set for yourself. Um, and, and de definitely aiming high. Don't, don't low ball it. You know, you really have to aim high. Um, because if it's not really dream worthy, what's the point? Um, I used to use a lot of visual cues too, ironically, visual cues. Um, I had a, uh, Olympic flag, a very huge Olympic flag in my, in my bedroom. And it was on, it was, I always set it on the wall and I brought it with me to college and I brought it to Colorado when I trained at the Olympic Training Center because it was, it was a very vivid, strong image that motivated me because I put it on the wall that was on the side of the room that I'd have to turn to to turn on or off the alarm. So when that alarm goes off in the morning and it's cold or dreary or snowing or whatever and you don't want to go and jump into a cold pool <laughs> or go for a run or get up and go to work early and you know early bird catches a worm kind of thing like I could see that flag and I knew that I had a choice and I didn't like the other option which was I wasn't ever going to get to that place mm -hmm. so it was like a constant reminder I don't I don't really um I don't really think it's I know some athletes use kind of a negative um thing where like if a you know maybe some a competitor says something negative about like kind of trash talking to the other athlete you know if this works for other people fine i never really encourage that in athletes either cuz i think it's a negative thing to go after a person you know i think that it's better to just do your best and make you know your own path um, but some people will put in pictures of their competitors in their lockers or an article where they say something negative about the person and like that's their inspiration. Mm. I like to take it from a more positive place and just seeing those rings and what they represent and what it means to me to be a gold medalist and like you're, you're an ambassador, you, you're an ambassador to the world uh, of that, you know, you know, the gold medals earn their value with each person it touches and you know, that's kind of how I just kind of live my life and you know, I feel that, that that's how every, hopefully every Olympian and Paralympian mm -hmm. decides to utilize those medals and put them to the best use possible. Yeah. So, Beth, I have one last question uh, before I ask it. Thank you so much for your time, by the way. This has been yeah. phenomenal. What, tell people what you're up to lately. <laughs> where, where people go check out your thoughts and, and everything <laughs> else. Well, I don't really have any formal um, websites or anything like that. Um, we need to change that. But, I know, yeah. I need to work on that. You're absolutely right. And maybe I'll utilize your help with that. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I, I am always pursuing other goals. And in this case, for me, I have another dream that I've kind of set for myself. And that mm -hmm. is to, to finally be able to work in the disabled sports world and, and or veteran, disabled veterans world. Um, I have worked in the field before um, and done event planning for sporting events for the disabled and I've worked with national organizations that help uh, empower people with disabilities who are blind and visually impaired to gain employment. Um, but I really want to get back into what I'm passionate about, which is working with the athletes and, and veterans with disabilities and being able to showcase and kind of be an advocate for them um, and, and try to provide uh, resources and, and um, competitions and, you know, coaches and trainings and clinics and camps and mm -hmm competitions for them to actually go compete in um, because I think the world is ready and I, I can see it changing and evolving over now most recently that people are ready to, to welcome athletes with disabilities of all different levels uh, in their family rooms watching it on television I, I just it's amazing it's taken as long as it has to get there um, you know it's funny because the Olympics they always show like 
the stories that are human interest stories like so and so has asthma and let's go dig up some story about so and so and her you know you know battle with a hangnail and it's like you're like hey every single athlete that goes to the Paralympics has an amazing that will blow your asthma story out of the water right. inspirational positively impactful story that you don't even have to like work hard to get all of them do and it's just yeah. amazing that we've taken so long to actually show it and I'm so glad that it's starting to come out and you know, I really want to be a part of that. Right now, I work for the federal government with the DoD and 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 do um, work with uh, contracting, defense contracting. Um, but my real passion is to be able to get back and doing the things that I love because I want to push my chair in at the end of the day and know that I have really made an impact on whether it's one person or several people in their lives and and through sport and through activities like that. Yeah. So, yeah. if anyone knows anything let me know <laughs> i'm sure if you want it you'll make it happen so yes that's yeah. true too so beth my last question is you know people only see the end result right they see tons of gold medals world records but the bottom line is it took a lot of hard work to get there tell me about one of the hardest training days Whew, try to block those out sometimes <laughs> um it's it was a, a very challenging schedule um, oh god between my high school training days and my last year training at the Olympic Training Center you know on average I'd be in the pool between four to six hours a day um, you're waking up we're waking up at like four and when high school I was waking up at four because my practices were kind of far away and they started at 445 and they went till seven you know, 15, and I had to go straight to school. And then from school, I went straight to practice for a three hour workout, which included, you know, an hour of dry lands. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, I, I never had more than two weeks off in any year. I mean, except when I was like little, little, but when I was doing full time tr swimming year round, it was no more than two weeks off and um, just constantly working. And it was Monday through Saturday. Uh, Sunday was my only day to sleep in and it was exhausting. I don't regret any of it. It was amazing opportunities came from it. Um, and I encourage anyone to experience it, but I will warn you <laughs> if you want a social life, <laughs> uh, aside from like meeting Aquaman underwater, I don't, it's kind of limited, you know? <laughs> so, um, but it was great. It was a wonderful, yeah. wonderful experience. Um, was there a specific time in practice that was the hardest? I remember BJ told me she swam for like three hours in gym shoes or something crazy like that. Were there any <laughs> strange any practice gym rituals? Shoe stories, but I can yeah. tell you um, there was one time, actually at the training center too. Uh, now this is later on in my career, so you know I was um, I was I was actually older than BJ, um, but. Uh, I was, so I was kind of pushing the limits of swimming and training uh, for the age group that I was in. So, and so was my um, teammate, who's a very good friend of mine, Trisha Zorn, who was training aside, beside me. And we were very tight. We were roommates. We've been friends for years. And um, she and I had done a, a test set. It was an aerobic, very challenging test set in the morning, which was a three-hour workout. And normally, when we'd have test sets there'd only be one really really seriously hard test set a day because it's it's fatiguing on your body it's not like one race it's like multiple races in a set within a hard practice so it's like very very fatiguing on the body in general yeah. so we did that in the morning and we were like woohoo we got to the test set it's over we don't have to worry about this afternoon because it won't be a test set and we did weights that day as well so we did a two hour weight lifting session um, which was more like a circuit training session and uh, we scarfed down some food and went to the sports medicine facility, got ourselves stretched out and ready to go for practice, thinking that it was just going to kind of be a breeze workout. And um, there's a great debate between swimmers. Like some people don't want to look at the workout beforehand, and some people just want to know. I'm one of the people who want to know what I'm headed into, kind of prepare myself mentally. And we, I picked up the notebook of my coach and looked at what we were doing and it was another insane hard test set 
And I just, I didn't say anything. I just put it down and I like walked away and like put my goggles on as they filled up with tears. You know, <laughs> like I was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Like, I don't know if I can pull myself together to do this. And then my friend, Trisha, looked at it and she did the same thing. She kind of like walked away, didn't say anything, really quiet. And we both like went into the locker room separately and we, we found out we both were crying because we were so like exhausted and just worn out and tired. And we just started laughing and crying at the same time. We're like, let's go do this. Let's, let's just, just do it. Let's get it over with. Let's do it. And we plowed through it and we did amazing. We had like amazing times and really good test set results. And yeah. it was just like that extra push. Remember I said like the, the, the elitist of the elite athletes know how to push through the pain and that the pain too is emotional. The pain too is like psychological. So it's a lot of those things together and, and staying positive for each other too. And we couldn't sit there and come to the wall and be like, Oh, I heard, I heard. You can't say that. You gotta, you gotta help your teammates rise up too. And if you say you're in pain, they're going to feel their pain and then they're going to start to, it's not going to affect their swimming. So you got to stay positive for each other, not yeah. just for yourself. Yeah. Beth, this has been fantastic. I want to be the oh, first good. one to thank you so much for doing this. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I, I keep, Keep recruiting all these wonderfully inspiring people to come on your show, and, I and, it. and it will only help everyone. I appreciate so, thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. All right. Take care. We'll be in touch.